Welcome back, ZeroK fans, to the December 1v1 tournament. We, well, December 2017 1v1 tournament. I remain your host, Chad, if you're three, three, and we're on a round three of the Swiss Bracket, which is going to be... A, well, I mean, it's a Swiss Bracket. It's round three. People have started to even out into roughly evenly matched opponents, and we're going to be starting out with Zinyu and Poke Rule. Because that is, well... I like to have the newer players or the lower lower ranked players first. I like just in or sorry in the middle. I like to have the not the first. I like to have them like third or fourth round, just to you know give them a bit of exposure, see what they're up to. And it's also the middle of the tournament, so it's not the finals where anything's super new, and it's not the opening rounds where it's hard to find an even match. It's just what it is. It's you know, starting to even out. And it's, you know, a few rounds into the tournament. So yeah, Pokedrill and Zinyu is going to be our next match. Wait, what round what map is this on anyway? Okay, let's see. Uh, Adansonia. Oh, Ooh, nice. Adansonia. I like this map. One of Sprung's Island maps. Always looked pretty. It's also pretty fun. Hmm. I mean, for, at any rate... We are going to be... Hmm. Sorry. Just going to be waiting on that tournament, or that game to be made, as I'm not sure where the players are exactly. But yeah, we'll get that set up. Also, just a reminder, if you are playing the tournament, please don't play matchmaker matches when you're one of the last matches to be done. Or if you guys are the first matches. But yeah, matchmaker matches are going to be a bit difficult to deal with because you can't play both. Anyway, waiting on this match, so I'm curious what we're going to see. Pokedrill, we did see before, went for highly defensive play. I'm not sure what Zinyu is up to. If Zinyu is a more aggressive player or also defensive, a lot of newer players have a tendency to be more defensive, and I'm pretty sure Pokedrill and Zinyu are likely team players, since a lot of players are team-based players. And in large team games, yeah, you often see that kind of play. You do often see play that is more built around being as defensive as possible, rather than play that is built around actually taking the game as quickly as possible. But, we'll see what happens when that happens. I mean, Adansonia is one of those maps that makes that sort of thing tricky. It's, I mean, on the one hand, there's a few options to work with. On the other hand, a few options for getting in. On the other hand, those options are very big. So, defending them can still be a bit of a challenge. It'll be curious to see what happens in Poketrill has confirmed in the chat that they do indeed play team games. Which also leads me to believe that I should probably restart the stream to make sure that there is, in fact, a two-minute delay so that no one can stream snipe. So, I guess I'll do it, I'll do it after this round. <laughs> and Skazi, I think it's coming. I'm a defensive player, too. I defend myself by killing enemy eco, so the enemy player can't build weapons to hurt me. Yeah, that's... Good choice. Oh, okay, well, at any rate, I will be putting a delay on this. If the delay is not on, because apparently it's not on the stream, since I'm seeing chat responses to what I'm saying immediately afterwards, so... Clearly, OBS does not add delay while the stream is ongoing, so there will be a restart of the stream after this round. But for now, we're going on to Pokedrill versus Zinyu. A interesting matchup. Well, I'm curious to see what's going to happen, because... Like I said, it gets a little unpredictable when you're dealing with players who aren't used to playing the 1v1 meta. And also necessarily used to playing Adansonia, which, like I said, does have a few ways of getting in. So it does it does lend itself somewhat to less defensive play, unless you go over to the northwest, or sorry, northeast or southwest, in which case you do get a little bit more room to maneuver, but Pokedrill is indeed choosing to go for the more normal more central star point, as is Zinyu. Zinyu, in fact, going for a jump bot factor right off the bat. No, that's, not, that's that's jump bot. I am a little surprised they're going for jump bot. I guess they want to get this area built up on the cliff. I'm a little curious ex exactly what the motivation was for that, but at any rate, jump bot's coming out from them. Cloak is coming out from Pokedrool. My only guess is the cloak bots 
are, I mean, they're a bit weak to pyros. Glaives have a harder time dealing with them than, say, bandits do. And not a lot of people have been using shield boss this tournament. So I could see the motivation there as a bit of a counter. But I'm curious to see what's going to happen. We do have the pyros coming out from Zinyu. We do have the glaives coming out from Pokedruel. And as before, Pokedruel is building up. I believe... I would not be surprised if Pokedruel was a subcom player. Like, if they're doing Commander, you generally build your power structures adjacent to metal extractors exactly like this. Because the way that its adjacency bonuses work, you actually have to have things literally next to another building in order to give them whatever advantage they get from being adjacent. Like whether it's extra build power, extra energy, fewer, lower energy costs, that sort of thing. It varies from building to building what the adjacency bonuses do. In 0k, on the other hand, you just need to have it in the circle. As long as the circles line up, everything's fine. Like you can have, and most players will indeed, have a line of solars between their metal extractors so that all the metal extractors get all the re, all the overdrive from all their power plants rather than having only a handful of power plants for each sol or each metal extractor which isn't quite as efficient because the way overdrive works it's more efficient to have power spread out across as many metal extractors as possible than it is to concentrate it on a single metal extractor but high level strategy analysis aside we do have the first couple engagements coming in here as Pyro coming in the main base. Pyro on the north side as well. The main base Pyro managing to get a bit of damage done. Not managing to actually destroy anything yet. There's not a whole lot of easy targets. And Pogadrool, they're not the most aggressive player, but I mentioned before, the defense does work. They do lose a metal extractor, but they still have a slight advantage of them. Or there's a slight advantage of metal economy. Still though, that is obviously over as we do have a lost metal extractor from Pogadrool. But Zinyu should still be able to hold on to... Well, actually hold on to a lot of an advantage. They're still able to get a fair amount of damage done. In fact, if they play this right, they could... And they are going to get rid of yet another Metal Extractor. Perfectly done off the ranges. Wow, Zinyu is playing very carefully there with these Pyros. And I mean very carefully. And it's actually a little risky because the Pyro was not set to hold position. So it could very easily have walked into the Lotus range. That was risky as hell and it paid off. Same time though... Pokedruel is coming in for a bit of a counterattack and not managing to find any traction as Zinyu's commander is obviously a commander. And commanders are really good at dealing with that stuff. So with that, Zinyu is starting out with a significant advantage. And there's not a whole lot that Pokedruel has to deal with this stuff. I mean, Pokedruel does have a decently strong defensive position, though they haven't rebuilt this metal extractor yet, which surprises me some. Because... For those of you not familiar, the difference between a good player and a great player is that a great player will rebuild metal extractors all the time. Like, they're never not rebuilding their metal extractors, and they're also never not building metal extractors. If they can get a new metal extractor, they will. So, if you want to be a great player, build more metal extractors. It's almost always worth it. If they can last for 30 seconds, it's worth it. They will be all profit after that point. But it looks like Pokedruel is starting to set up the expansion over to the southwest. I still think that's going to be a little late, but it's still worth doing. One thing I would like to see is this Conjure going over to the eastern side. Well, maybe the eastern side. The Pyros are there. They are a bit scary. But going over around the map and trying to get, well, faster expansions. I mean, this Conjure is not doing anything. So I would like to see it go over here. Maybe go up to the center. Just, you know, help, exp help expand a bit. Yeah, the Pyros are scary, but with the amount of Glaives that Pokedrill has, they could take on this Pyro, no problem. Eight Glaives? Nine Glaives? Yeah, Pyros are dead. Pyros can't do anything. They have to run. And that would open things up quite elegantly for Pokedrill to be able to expand and get into this game. At this point, though, Zinyu does have a 7 metal per second advantage, having basically taken their entire north side, taken both start locations, on top of the Reclaim... It's not going to be easy for Pokedrill to win this if they don't take the economy that they have right there. So with that, I mean, Zinyu is going to be able to get a fair bit of damage in over to the north, the southwest, just because that is three powers against two glaives. And the nine glaives here, I er, I appreciate the fact that they are moving out. They are trying to find some room, trying to find some way of pushing. But unfortunately, Pokedrill does not seem to be aware that there are Pyros coming in. They are aware that something's coming in. They see that there is a radar. There are radars. Well, the radar spotting enemies coming in. And of course, those enemies are likely to be Pyros. 
but they aren't managing to put forces in place to deal with that, so at this point, they are going to be fighting on the back foot when it comes to dealing with these Pyros, losing the Southwest expansion, and ultimately losing the only expansion they'd really been building up thus far. They do have this one expansion on the sandbar, which is still good. Glad for them that they have that. But even then, it is still a bit tricky. Given the way that they've set up their Glaives, the commander is going to be able to defend itself. But the Glaives are going to go down one at a time because they are not clumped up in any way. Like, they have no connection. They're not going to be able to support each other. All of their fire ranges are completely non-overlapping. So good luck with that. So with the Southwest down, the Sandbar is the only expansion the Pokedrill has. Mind you, with that expansion, they are managing to find a bit more of an even economy. But again, the way that they're doing the overdrive, they have managed to link up a bit. It's still, though, not quite as effective, especially since Zinu does have way more power. And also, I mean, the one for wind generators, a bit risky. Wind generators are very volatile, especially on this map, but hey, not a bad idea. When it works, it works. And that being said, although that will work, the economy is going to work for Zinu. The army and military placement is not. Nice picks from Pokedrill for the unit types, because at this point, Pokedrill can easily push out of the center of the map, easily get rid of what Xenu has built up, and that is going to possibly turn this around. Like, giving Pokedrill quite a bit of room to maneuver, they can start expanding, they can set up this conjure quickly over to the southwest and over to this little expansion up here. The commander as well... Oh, it's idle right now. But it could easily build up here, it could easily build up over the sandbar, just across the entire sandbar. And not much is going to be able to contest these, ro these Ronin. I mean, the Jacks are certainly trying, and actually they are not in a bad position to do so, but they are slow units, and the Ronin can just get pot shots off them. That's basically what we're seeing right now, is intelligent unit counters coming out from Pokedrill. So if Pokedrill is able to maintain this and able to get more of a metal advantage, more of an efficiency advantage, an attrition advantage, that will give them a lot of room to expand, and they are starting to take it. Setting up a couple of Lotuses over here just to make sure, because Pyros can come over the hill, so, yeah. I understand the care there. But at the same time, they are going to be setting up finally that Southwest. Not a whole lot's contesting it. And now they've managed to get rid of most of the army coming in from Xenia. Or at the very least, keep it on the ropes. Pokedrill can finally get into this game properly. Of course, that's assuming they're able to produce enough. And that's assuming they're able to, they don't lose out to excess, which they are currently doing. And in case you're wondering, yes, I do just want to say these Rockos because... That was the name they had for years. I mean, literally for, like, 20 years. But, like, back when Zero back when Total Annihilation was the game in question, not Zero K. Zero K wasn't even a twinkle in the eye when it was still complete annihilation. They were Rockos. But, eh, trademarks are trademarks. So, there you go. Actually, trademark, potential trademark disputes are potential trademark disputes. Regardless, trademark disputes being what they are, the actuality is that Pokedrill's armies can be completely wiped out. The Jacks had managed to find a way in, did manage to get a lot of damage done, and there wasn't much else to peel from the Ronin, so with that, Pokedrill again is dealing with a bit of a tricky situation. They have finally gotten their caretaker up, so they are able to use their metal without accessing as much. But, oh boy, they have not expanded. Why this Conjure didn't have metal extractors queued is beyond me, but that is a lot of metal on the table. As I've said before, repeatedly, 30 seconds, it pays off. Just put metal extractors up. If you aren't sure, build a metal extractor. If it dies, oh well, you lost 75 metal. If it lives, awesome, you're gaining 2 metal per second. And that's what you need. Still though, Pokedrill, despite the fact that they have a much worse power infrastructure and thus much less overdrive, in fact, I don't know how they're going to get any overdrive, seeing as they are, in fact, running out of energy relative to metal, they are managing to maintain a relatively close lead onto Xenu. In fact, I'd say that they have... A slightly stronger position, considering that Zinyu is relying more on overdrive for their economy. Like, were it not for overdrive, Pokedrill would have the economic advantage. The problem, however, is that Pokedrill is not using that overdrive. In fact, they don't have enough power. At all. Like, more power plants will be needed from them, because otherwise they just don't have much, and they are going hard for those defenses, and that is the one thing. Like, ugh. I mean, I get the sense of fear, but... This is not Supreme Commander, if that's even what they're thinking of. Although, like I said, they've managed to change up their solar plants, which make it more of a zero-k style arrangement, so props for that. But still, you don't need this many defenses. In fact, this is counterproductive, because those defenses, every single one of these Faradays, that's 250 of Mendel, that's 
another three Ronin. Or another four Glaives. For every one of these caretakers. And considering that they are building their armies out of Ronin and Glaives primarily, why wouldn't you want to have mobile forces? I mean, static defenses are good. Don't get me wrong. They're very useful on the front lines. On the back lines like this, especially with so many redundant defenses, it's not that relevant. And, I mean, it's... The key thing here is at your main base. The key thing here is redundant. The key thing here is the fact that Pokedrill is building back. If they built the defenses on this ridge, or up here, that would make more sense. Or even on some of these sandbars, that would be a bit harder to maintain. But building them in the main base is essentially just asking to die, because they're essentially just saying, okay, I'm going to give up everything else where all of my money is, but you're not going to take the last few metal extractors at my factory. But by that point, there's no money. Like the, the economic advantage is solidly in favor of their opponent, so it doesn't matter if their main base has boatloads of defenses. Eventually, their opponent is going to crack them, because they're just going to have more money, going to be able to throw more troops at it, and there's not much that the person defending can do. So, with that, I feel like Pokedrill is kind of seeding more than they need to. Not kind of, they're seeding more than they need to. Zinyu, on the other hand, I like the way they have their defenses set up. Stardust at every area. I mean, just make sure raiders can't get in. I also Strider up coming into the northwest. While at the same time, their main base does have, well, it has a picket. You know, just in case air comes in, just to dissuade that. Or sneaky raiders, dissuade them. No, that's a pretty... That's an intelligent, if slightly light, defensive setup. I mean, I'd say the main base, in Zinu's case, I'd be interested... I mean, I could see them probably putting up more defenses if they saw enemy units coming in. I would expect that's what would happen. But also, I mean, you have a factory. A factory is a defensive structure. Still, though, Stardust is also a definitely a defensive structure. You'd be able to get quite a bit of value off these placeholders, but the Jacks are the real damage dealers. The placeholders just make life miserable for anyone trying to help out support. Which, I'll grant, is a very important thing to get rid of. Because you get rid of the placeholders, now these jacks don't have as much room to get in. And now the the Reavers can get all the damage they like, because not much is going to stop them, not much is going to hold them in place. Placeholders can only do so much when there's only one of them. Actually, this is being very efficient. If Pokedrill can win this fight, they do have a good chance of getting into a strong economic position. But again, it's going to come down to energy. They need more energy, they have enough production capacity, but they need more energy to support that. Just a few more power plants. Like, I don't know, three or... F I don't know, an extra ten. An extra ten power plants would... That would be good for most of the game. That would handle Reclaim. That would handle pretty much all the Fluxes. That would add a little bit of Overdrive. I'd be, like, 60 energy for Poker Tools. Inu has a lot of energy, however, and that is... That is perfect. They're going to have a lot of Reclaim to work with if they take this. And even if they don't, they could still grab the Reclaim. And indeed, they have a worker of the Constable right here. They could do that. If they grab the Reclaim, that'll open things up quite beautifully. And if they do that, well, they've got the energy for it. They just don't have the production capacity, sadly. They, like, that is sort of the thing. Pokedrill has the production capacity. They have loads of caretakers that have 40 build power in the factory, but they don't have the energy to really sustain that. While Xenu, on the other hand, has loads of metal, loads of energy, but not all that much build power over in their factory. The Strider Hub is up, but the Strider has no support. It's not building anything either, but it has no caretakers to support it. So even though Xenu has managed to take the center, they've managed to get all this Reclaim, and I mean all this Reclaim. How much Reclaim is this? 2,000 Metal of Reclaim. Okay, so yeah, 2,500 Metal of Reclaim. That's... That is substantial. I mean, if Pokedrill had won that fight and gotten the Reclaim, this map could have turned around on a dime. But as it stands, Pokedrill did lose that. And with that, I don't really see what they have to work with, since the economic advantage has solidly gone in Xenu's favor. They have the static economy. They have the Reclaim. They have enough defenses to stop any trivial raids from destroying either of those things. And they have five Firewalkers coming in. <laughs> they, have essentially a stri they have essentially a catapult in five parts coming in to Pokedrill's base and tearing it apart piece by piece. Also a Scorpion, because why not? So, Xenu is poised to take this and take it handily. Unless Pokedrill switches over, maybe throws in some air. I mean, there's not a whole lot dealing with air. Although, to be fair, the moderators would be an issue. I could see Harpies managing to get some value in this, but it's not likely to happen. Again, Pokedrill is mostly focused on making sure that their main base lives as long as possible, which I, again, don't get. Those shield generators over here would 
well, they'd be a lot more useful. They'd protect the expansions. The Faraday's up in the front. I mean, if they'd been built over in this cliff, that could have actually stopped a few of these in their tracks and possibly allowed them to be killed by, ro by other roving forces. Still, though, we do have the sites coming in here. 2,500 metal worth. Oh, boy. That's going to be painful if they're lost. But they should be able to get rid of a picket here and there. And actually, with this many, they should be able to wipe out most of the defenses no problem. At the very least, being used as an effective scouting force, they could get in the back lines, and if they manage to do that, I I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the factory go down. I think the commander is the target, and I don't agree. If they're going to go for anything, the factory would make the most sense, although, like, again, I don't know, like, ten sides. Ten sides right off the bat, that's... That's already a situation where, to me, it feels like it's a bit of a scramble to find value for them rather than being necessarily the best option. Like, I don't... Two or three sides, sure. Ten sides. Man, you better get your money's worth on that. And that is exactly what Pokestool's trying to do. Going to the factory. Oh, right! As the... Oh, that has got to be painful. I mean, the problem is all these are slow. Or all, all the constables slow down their forces. And on top of that, the plays will be coming in here. And on top of on top of that, you have everything repairing the factory. Not really the best timing. And then the pyro on... Again, on top of that, as it's being built. And yeah, the pyros are dying, but the factory's not going to go down. Like, the thing is, scythes only deal 200 damage a pop, so there's only so much they can... Oops, that's not even that. So the scythes, they deal 200 damage a hit. Ten scythes could have theoretically taken it out in two hits, if it weren't for their pairs, if it weren't for the placeholder. But the placeholder just got built, and repairs were happening constantly. So there was no way for that to work. And at this point, Zinyu is going in for the kill, while Pokedrill... Not too bad in the economy, but for whatever reason, not building units. I suppose they've thrown in the towel. But I'm not sure. Still, though, like I said, this is a Strider's value worth of Firewalkers. 4,500 metal. That's more expensive than the Scorpion being built in the back here. I think it's actually more expensive than a Catapult. Or Merlin. Sorry, it's Merlin now. More expensive than a Merlin. And that's 3,500 metal. Like, that is, like I said, a Merlin in five parts. There's no way the Pokedrool can take that on head on. I'm really surprised they haven't switched over to air or added in anything else or have been building stuff for the last two minutes. I'm really not sure why they haven't been building stuff for the last two minutes. I mean, considering the forces here, I can almost see just a boatload of glaives rushing in here and getting. Okay, a dozen would die. But you, with 40 metal, you could easily build through 30, 40. That would work fairly well. And yeah, chat's pointing out, and it's important to note, Firewalkers don't stack. The thing about fire damage is that only the initial hit stacks. And the only initial hit is not that much. Actually, come to think of it, I'm pretty sure with Firewalkers... Yeah, there is some immediate damage, but it's mostly the burn. And fire does not stack. Fire is one of those things that when you use it, it just burns for a consistent rate if there's fire. It's a binary state, which is one of the reasons Phoenixes are a bit tricky to use well, and another reason why we don't see Firewalkers in large groups. To be fair, though, the direct hit damage is still doing a number on Pokedrill's forces. All the, the Zeus coming in here, solid choice, but unfortunately not a whole lot of them, despite the fact that there is the production capacity to make a lot of them. Doesn't really matter. I gotta say, though, Faraday's do kind of make sense, and this is where I can kind of see, I can kind of see where Pokedrill was coming from. Like, I'm not sure I totally under, totally agree, but hey, they managed to stop the Jacks. At the same time, though, the rest of their entire field is open. Right, the Powers are going to get rid of this expansion over to the northeast. The Sandbar expansions are still basically dead. These Glaives are having nothing. Like, they're adding nothing to this. They'd go down in a second trying to be defensive, and... They're not helping out getting rid of the Firewalkers. And also, yeah, shield graphics have actually been changed a bit. They've been changed over to use a different particle system than before. And the overall graphic hasn't been shifted or hasn't been updated from that to match the previous graphic. So it's just a, a sphere with some slight distortion. So that is kind of that. Pokedrool. I mean, they have... They have the Nimbus... Multiple of them, really. But even then, it's like... The Scorpion is winning. The Scorpion essentially is going to be the thing... 
that keeps Zinyu in this, well, Zinyu able to push this fight. Granted, they can just push this fight. They don't even have to go back and repair. The fact that they are doing so, it's uh, it's perfectly careful play. Poker is not going to be able to rebuild quickly enough, nor are they really trying to. I mean, at least, though, they do have air, which I did point out I wanted to see. So, good job, Poker on that one. The downside, though, is a lot of anti air is going to be coming up, and even then, doesn't really need it. There's 14 moderators. That's more than enough to get rid of all of these nemesis. On top of the scorpion. On top of the fact that all of them are being repaired. And there's nothing to get rid of a large army here. I mean, a Black Dawn would almost be favored, considering the circumstances. In fact, yeah, Black Dawns. Get a couple Black Dawns. Just rush them in here and start raining missiles down on this army. Yeah, they're expensive, and yeah, it's risky. But it's going to be a lot better than the Nimbus is trying to do consistent machine gun damage to have the same effect. Because they're probably not going to. Also, sir, really? You're going to build a Cerberus, previously known as Behemoth, for main base stuff. I guess that explains why Pogadrill was going defensive. Their playstyle is build up defenses, build up artillery, use the artillery to break open the forces. I'm, I am sure Pogadrill is a, is a previously a Supcom player. This feels very Supreme Commander. But besides that, yeah. Did I say Blast Wings? Not Black Dawns. Or Revenants, as they're called now. Revenants, my mistake. Yeah, Revenants would be the way to go. I would think, just because we'd be able to more efficiently deal with all these forces so the, mod well, the moderators still get their shots off. But everything else wouldn't. Most importantly, the Scorpion wouldn't. Or at least not so much. Still, though, it would be interesting... I mean, Nimbus and Revenant together, I think, would be the way to go. Regardless, Pokedrill is very quickly running out of money with which to do so one way or the other. And with that, I don't see a whole lot of room for Pokedrill to get out of this. Even if the Cerberus is built, like, where would it go? What would it do? It would maybe get rid of some of these forces. I think Pokedrill does have radar of them. Yeah, they do. At least of some of them. Is that going to work? Well... Let's see. I mean, it's firing. It's not sure what it's targeting. Ah, there it is. I'm trying to get the commander. I mean, no, that's not going to happen. Cute, but no. Also, the news is coming in here. This is exactly the thing I was thinking would not work, and it's actually working out better than I thought it would. Getting rid of quite a few of the firewalkers. At great cost of the Nimbuses themselves, but it is able to get rid of a lot of the moderators as well. Still not enough, and the Archangels were already prepared. Zinyu was ready for this. And even the Scorpion is not going down. Scorpion is way too much HP for this to work. Like, this is why I mentioned Black Dawn. Because Black Dawn, it's just going to be able to come in here, fire a bunch of missiles, and yeah, if it dies, it dies, but at least its damage is front-loaded. But not Nimbuses. Nimbuses take a while to kill things. They're long-term fire support. They are not there to wipe out a, a group in a hurry. Now, granted, that is kind of what the Cerberus is for, but the service is so inaccurate that I'm not sure how effective that's going to be. I just managed to get some damage in. I will grant that. But I don't see how much damage it's going to be able to get in there. So, yeah, that's going to be Zinyu pushing in here, trying to do their best, as Bokadrul is essentially playing Total War inside of 0k, which, granted, they're actually not that different in terms of overall playstyle. But as it stands... Not much is left here as Pokedrool, I mean, trying their best with the, with the Nimbuses, but Zinyu has the entire map. They've got everything. What the heck? No. So, yeah, I don't see any easy way for Pokedrool to get out of this. And neither is Pokedrool throwing in the tail. That is. That is the game. Oh, yeah, that blue thing. That blue thing is D Cloak Range. Oh, no, wait, no, not decloak range. What am I saying? What is? Oh! Oh, interesting. Decloak range is always shown. Did I hit something? Huh. Okay. But yeah, that is indeed, as far as I can tell, decloak range. Cool. I did not know that. All right. Well, anyway... 
that was interesting. And also, Xenia has never seen a behemoth or a service before, which doesn't surprise me. The fact that jump bots are something Pokédrill hasn't seen before does surprise me, since jump bots are a reasonably popular factory. But the fact that Xenia hasn't seen late game artillery before doesn't surprise me at all, because that doesn't happen in 1v1. I've seen it happen in like one or two other tournament matches, one of which I think was a 2v2 tournament. So, yeah, you don't see these. They are expensive, and static artillery doesn't work. Like, we are seeing that the Cerberus doesn't manage to get a whole lot of fire, and it's getting spotted for, but it's not long enough range. So really, this is being a bit of a glorified defensive building, and that's... I mean, that's nice. It's not the most effective. But yeah, the thing is that there's... For those of you not familiar, there's actually a lot of these little advanced factor or advanced artillery pieces. I mean, yeah, the Cerberus we just saw, the Big Bertha, which would be much better for this kind of game plan. If you want to have a long-range artillery system, go for the Big Bertha. Don't go for the Cerberus. In this position, the Cerberus is essentially a glorified defensive platform. And then there's, I mean, the Trinity, which is your nuke launcher. And that's just death to everything, since that's nukes. It takes forever to build. Like, the thing itself is 18 metal per second just to build any missiles, and it takes three minutes to do. And you cannot speed that up using builders. And the Zenith, which is essentially just a super weapon that's, again, full map range, or very large range. Definitely full map here, which is just throw meteors at a place, which gives metal too. This grave party, which is, again, fire off a bunch of stuff. And then Starlight, which is a win button. You put that in, a laser comes out that fires towards your, command, your opponent's commander and any other points of interest, destroying them near instantly with essentially no counterplay. The counterplay being, it's 40,000 metal, good luck building one in any decent sized game. It's for free-for-alls to end them. That's what it's for. In fact, all those endgame things are for free-for-alls, essentially. The, the Cerberus and the Big Bertha are usable in large team games, but otherwise, yeah, the entire thing, and I guess the Missile Silo as well is another one, but otherwise, yeah. The really big ones, Disco Ray Party, Zenith, and Starlight, are meant to end free-for-alls. That is what they do. Possibly also big team games. Not much else. But yeah, I mean, I wouldn't suggest Pokedruel does this. Like, this strategy is essentially just asking to lose slowly rather than trying to win. But, I do like the fact that they have the Blast Wings up. I do like the fact that those Blast Wings are coming in and dealing a fair bit of damage. Managing to put Zinyu in a slightly less than perfectly comfortable position. But at the same time, they aren't managing to do that much. So I wouldn't suggest this kind of thing before in the future. But if Pokedruel insists, at the very least... Big Bertha is a better option than Cerberus, if you want to start putting pressure on your opponents. It's a far better option. At the very least, you could deal with his army in the front, wouldn't have to necessarily... Like, you would be forcing more pressure on Zinyu. Zinyu wouldn't be able to hold as well as they are. But I still don't recommend this strategy just because you aren't getting your economy going. Like, you're relying on overdrive way more, and ultimately you're just seeding territory. Which means you're seeding metal, which means you're seeding the production capacity, which means your opponent is going to ultimately be able to outproduce you. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Oh, yeah, and also, if you can, terraform the ground below, as Skazi's pointing out in the chat, terraform the ground below the behemoth, because doing that will help a lot. Oh, one of the scorpions actually went down. Of course, there's a second scorpion, and Pokedrew realizing there's not much hope for them left. Oh my goodness. Wow. 30,000 extra metal was spent by Zinyu than by Pokedrool. And it shows. Like, unit value again. Wow. For the majority of the match, there was a, a 25,000 metal deficit on Pokedrool's side. That's the thing that you get. That's what you get when you have that much of a metal income difference. And also an energy income difference. That was the biggest thing. Zinyu had a massive energy income. It didn't even matter that Pokedrill had what they had in terms of metal. The energy was what gave Zinyu the match, more than anything. But hey, growing pains. A lot of things to learn. This game is fairly complicated. So, that was that. I think that's actually probably the only match left, come to think of it, because that was a very long match. 29 minutes. Which, not surprising, is part of the reason I picked it as well, because I figured that that match would be the longest match, and I was right. So, with that, we have 
most of round three done. And it looks like round four is going to be starting shortly. So yeah, we have Pokemoko beating Top Cat, Galio beating Orphelius, Diamond Friend beating 400, and Kingstad beating Icons. Pokestrola just saw to lose to Zinnu, and a near and Google Frog going at it. Also, a good match to see. I'm kind of sad it happened in round three rather than later, because it's probably going to be the most even match this game or this tournament. Oh, okay. Apparently, Google Frog versus Anir is still going on and it's still going strong, and might be a thing to watch then because that. Wow, 32 minutes on this map. I mean, that's that's kind of scary, in fact, come to think of it. But, I mean, might as well. Kind of curious what's going to happen here, because I feel like it's just going to be a lot of... Oh, crap, I didn't show the bracket. Bracket! That's the bracket. That's how the bracket's going right now. Alright, so at this point we have... Google Frog and Anir... Google Frog going for Amphib, and you're going for Jumpbot. Again, jump on this map. Like I said, the cliff's kind of convenient for that. But it looks like Google Frog managing to get a fair bit of momentum just off of some early expansion as they are wont to do. As a Google Frog often plays this game. But Anir. I got the boys coming in here. Sorry, Anir's going for the Amphibs. Google Frog with jump bots. And uh, boys, as always, quite useful. Opening up some air control as well, which... Ah, I see. I guess they're letting Nimbus in. But at this point, Google Frog is not letting themselves be open to air attacks. While at the same time, blocking up what they can. It looks like, wow, very early air control from both players. Near managing to maintain their own airspace. While also managing to get the raids in, in the south. This raid is potentially huge. The sheer amount of boys coming in here. And not a whole lot of counterplay potential either. Just because there's not a whole lot that's going to be hitting anything underwater. So at this point, Anir getting a lot of momentum on Google Frog. While Google Frog, on the other hand, with the Locust over the Northeast, able to take care of some of Anir's expansions. But again, that is difficult to deal with. As At the same time, Anir is getting rid of Google Frog Southwest, or at least trying to. Not managing to get as much momentum as Google Frog did. But still, with the boys, Anir is able to get loads of damage in here. And that's the key thing. With the daggers coming in, it's going to be a lot harder for the boys to be able to do their job. But... Uh, that almost doesn't matter with the boys in the center being the real stars of the show right now. Moving into the Grizzly, able to open up the center. Bit of competition with the Sumo, but even then, the center is partially broken. The back line is heavily damaged as Anir taking advantage of that center attack and the distractions created by that to rush in to the southwest. Take out what Google Frog has here. And ideally for them, get rid of most of the stuff. The Claymore is coming in to do what damage they can, but only managing to get rid of a handful of boys. Well, at the same time, though, this little bit of terraforming does mean the boys cannot go further up the hill. Very good use of terraforming, by the way. This actually makes it impossible for any ground units to get in that aren't that aren't bots or walker types. Actually, I think boys might should be able to get up there regardless. Still, though, build it slightly higher and nothing can get in or out, which is perfect. Still, though, a near with a clearly strong metal advantage, a 4,000 metal unit attrition advantage... And the economy is basically even the entire time, so that's essentially a strider's worth of economic difference between the two players right now. And it actually is not going to be a big deal. Google Frog is expanding their, well, expanding, or getting closer. In fact, getting past it, managing to win the attrition war ultimately. Thanks to attacks over on the north side of the map, as Google Frog with these jacks, with jack drops, able to get rid of pretty much Anir's entire main base. Wiping that almost completely. While at the same time, Anir is managing to get some damage in the back lines, they have no real beachhead to take. And so they have nothing to work with in terms of any footholds. And with that, I'm not sure what they're going to be able to do here. They have a large army. They had a fairly large attrition advantage. But the question is, where can they actually apply it? Because they can't really deal with this expansion. They can't easily flank around the back. The main base has too many things built in it. Although, I suppose that is actually a pretty good target. And, in fact, Anir is going for the flank, having to deal with some of the halberds, but they should be able to get rid of a lot of these defenses in the back and open up the center. As long as they don't have to deal with the center stinger, they should be okay. That being said, though, Anir does have a lot of factories to work with for spare factories because, I mean, they lost the main base, but they had other stuff built elsewhere. 
So it's not not the thing to worry about here. The thing to worry about, of course, is the center is actually possibly breaking. Gook Frog is potentially going to open up a lot of or going to open up in a lot of places, and I don't see that necessarily changing anytime soon. But it could be the case that Google Frog might actually lose the center defensive position. And if that happens, well, that's a near taking a lot. But if that happens after the Ravens manage to do their job, then it, it could be too little too late. As Google Frog is still able to get the Jacks and still able to get the factories destroyed. Still able to get most of this entire section completely wiped out. So with that, I say a near is likely on the back foot. But Anir still managed to get the economy. The problem, of course, is they don't have the production. They still have factories, but they don't have enough caretakers. They don't have a whole lot of support infrastructure for that production. And without that, it becomes far harder to maintain what production they have. Especially as they are losing production pieces here and there, losing factories here and there, not managing to take a whole lot of ravens in the process. And Google Frog able to get a 10,000 metal attrition advantage as a result. But if they manage to hold that... They manage to hold that, they're good. If Google Frog doesn't manage to hold that, though, if Anir is able to get some momentum back in, they are starting to get some momentum back in terms of attrition. This could turn right around as Anir is going around the back. There's nothing stopping him. There's hardly anything over here. The Raven is, sorry, the, not the Raven, the Razor is the one thing here, but with all of this, all these harpies, 23 harpies, I'm oh, sorry, 21 harpies on top of a few tridents. I mean, the, ra the Razor is doing damage, but there's so many harpies that the Razor essentially is nothing. It almost doesn't matter, and the main base as well taking a lot of damage. There should be all the ravens flying around, and indeed there are doing what damage they can. I mean, there's 13 of them just in the, just around here alone, but still, these harpies coming in here are nothing to be trifled with. They get rid of that razor, actually, if they can get rid of the razor. The problem, of course, is the razor is protected by the stingers. But even without that, the sheer amount of damage they're able to deal, getting rid of the pylons, getting rid of the factories, possibly getting rid of some of the power infrastructure, I mean, that's certainly something. Or at least getting rid of the urchins, allowing their amphibs to cross freely over the south side of Google Frog's base. Still, though, Google Frog has acquired a massive metal advantage. Between Reclaim and... Oh, between Reclaim and Overdrive and Static Economy, they are still way ahead right now. And on top of, again, losing yet another factory to just Raven Assaults. And that's consistently what's happening. Anir is constantly on the back foot, trying to rebuild factories over and over and over again. I mean, that Harpy Assault, that did a number. But now with all these flails up, I mean, 16 flails coming in here from Google Frog to get rid of the Harpies. Those Harpies have lost their one opportunity, and they managed to get a fair bit of damage, but they did not manage to get rid of the Airplane Factory. They did not manage to get rid of the Fusion Plant. They really didn't manage to get rid of most of the infrastructure over here from Google Frog. So not a whole lot of value was lost. And Google Frog still able to maintain 15 Ravens getting basically everything around the map no problem they've just they've got their artillery right there like that's your artillery piece bombers that is essentially what they do and they do it very well so now the harpies numbers down to about nine and there's not much for a near in terms of economy there's very little in terms of production and you're only having the gunship plant and it's not even doing anything the excess is real at this point I'm actually not sure what Anir even plans to do, because the gunship plant's not going to be able to find much traction on account of there being over a dozen flails wandering the map. Just making life difficult for any air units that come up. I mean, how many are there? Two dozen flails. Two dozen flails. Okay. Yeah, good luck with that. Although I do like to use... Oh, very nice. Great Thresher there. Getting rid of almost all of the air units, but at the same time, all the wasps going down to two dozen flails. Who builds two dozen flails? Well, apparently Anir builds two dozen flails. You know, the Thresher's coming in here. It's it's enough to dissuade, or at least enough to get rid of the Ravens for the future. But still, ten Ravens are left. And while the Hovercraft platform did not die, there's no area that can be built here. The flails are just going to hang around. I mean, they're scouting, I suppose. Not much is going to stop them, but at the same time, there goes that factory. And Anir managing to get yet another Hovercraft factory over the western side of the map. But that's it! And you're thrusting the towel. I mean, well done, though. They managed to maintain a very close proximity in metal for most of the game. I mean, the metal income was neck and neck. Unit value. Oh, unit value. Yeah, once Google Frog got that attrition advantage, it really snowballed from there. Like, it was holding even, and then the attrition advantage happened. And basically, actually, that was... 
That wasn't quite the assault coming in with the the harpies. That would have been that would have been the ground attack was destroyed. That would have been as Gufa came in the back and started wiping out Anir's base. That's when most of the unit value was lost and most of the production was lost. And that was harsh. Yeah, definitely where that fell apart. Like where Anir ran into a lot of problems. And anyway, with that, I'm going to be moving on to the next round, because that was the last match of round three. Moving on to round four. As, well, I mean, it'll be interesting to see who plays in round four. Google Frog now undefeated, while Anir, on the other hand, has just lost their first match of the tournament today. Though I expect it may be the only match they lose. They are a very strong player. And oh, it surprised me if this was it for them. But still, Guy Up and Google Frog both at the top right now. Three wins each. Well, a lot of people in the 2 1 range. I'm curious to see what happens in the next round as that gets set up. But for now, I'm just going to take a short break as we wait for round four to be completed. So stay tuned. Be back in a couple minutes. <laughs> 